the second century will evolve. And when the equivalent debate took place at the end of the Second World War about the Cold War and the long historic clash um, between the United States of America and the Soviet Union, it was a debate reserved for a small handful of policymakers and politicians around Washington and in the chancelleries of Europe. The vast bulk of the public found out there it's only after the course of history had been set. And I think the whole world needs to be engaged in debating what sort of world we want to see and live in. And whether, as uh, Wes Huntington said, there is inevitably a clash of civilizations coming. He wrote uh, that seminal um, essay uh, a couple of years after the end of the Cold War, at a time when others were saying we were in the end of history, he actually had a quite jarring and discordant note. And if you go back to reread that, Whilst this debate about the clash of civilizations now inevitably seems to be polarized between West and Islam, his was a broader analysis saying there is a clash between the West on one hand and rival civilizations, and he chose both Islam and what he called Confucianism, um, effectively most people would say China, which is a lot easier and quicker. I never think at time, if you want a clash of civilization, Taking on two-thirds of the rest of the world is most probably not a good idea. They're bad odds to start with. But I also think it's a completely false choice. We didn't know over the last few days I, what would have happened in the Big Brother house. And whilst this is trivial and extremely bad television, I think it's been absolutely revealing about a transformation um, in British society. If that programme and that vote had happened 30 years ago, I think the result um, would have been very different. People would not have been um, rejecting um, Jay Goody and, and the others in the House. They would have been laughing along with them. And this 82% vote, um, which is effectively a rejection of bigotry and ignorance, I think is a brilliant signal to the rest of the world about the sort of society Britain is becoming, one that is tolerant. And what I suppose we haven't fully taken on board is that everything that was happening there and which we were watching on our televisions was being watched instantaneously around the rest of the world. In India, which is the second biggest source of inward investment to this city, with tens of thousands of jobs dependent on it. If that vote had been different last night, I suspect I'd have been having to get on a plane to go and actually repair um, some of the damage and actually make it absolutely clear. But, well, I don't often get clapped when I'm announcing I'm going on a foreign visit. <laughs> you, you should, um, we'd love to have you on the London Assembly. <laughs> the perspectives that are before us uh, I think are quite clear. Um, I believe that the sort of world that's emerging, one in which everything is known instantaneously, in which I mean, the things that people use, uh, the films they watch, are gradually becoming truly global, is one in which people have the choice to select for themselves what they find attractive in all cultures, and therefore, rather than a clash of cultures and civilizations, I think we are at the beginning of a genuine global civilization emerging. Not one in which any one culture is predominant, but which ordinary people in their billions, by the economic choices they make, will validate what they find attractive in cultures across the world. I went to Singapore, um, as you know, for the International Olympic Committee vote. I found a completely different culture I mean, but much in it, in terms of the cleanliness of society, the uh, lack of crime, infinitely attractive. And I would have thought people around the world would have found that infinitely attractive. But it's very much a product of a very different culture and civilization. The cultural debate, which has been, I think, very badly handled in this country over the last year, um, this idea where we've been told that multiculturalism is uh, not the way forward, that it's ridiculous to treat all norms, cultural norms, as equally valid. No one believes that. Nobody who believes in a multicultural society believes all cultural norms are equally valid. Female genital mutilation is not valid, 
and should not be allowed. I mean, taken to its most ridiculous extreme, you would come to the point of saying cannibalism is a, a valid lifestyle choice. That is not the case. But in the emerging global society, the billions will decide what they find best and what will actually spread. The position, I think, oddly enough, is typified um, by something written by John Stuart Mill centuries ago. And it actually, I think, is still a very good guide for how we should conduct ourselves and organise ourselves within nations and between nations. And it was basically that you should live your life as you choose to do so, as long as you don't harm others. And if I read the exact form of words he chose, I think they're a very good guide for um, what happens within nations and between nations today. He said, the only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilised community against his will is to prevent harm to others. Well, we might say he or she these days, but then you couldn't have been expected to anticipate um, quite the range of changes that have happened in our society. That's still a very good guide. And that is a very different um, situation, and it's a classic liberal prescription um, from the classic conservative um, prescription that there has to be a requirement for a common ideology. Um, whether uh, what form that takes, it's different in each society. But what we're really saying is you don't have to be Christian, you don't have to be Muslim, you don't have to be a monarchist or a Republican, you don't have to be British, or you don't have to be French, as long as you leave others to lead their life as they do. As long as you obey the law, you should be free to live your life as you choose. And to impose on a people uh, uh, an enforced acceptance of any of those strictures, a Christian code or a Muslim code, is fundamentally wrong. That is a deeply conservative and authoritarian position. And it is one that cannot possibly survive in a world that is becoming as open as ours. We need to be able to freely choose. And in a situation where the expansion of choice is accelerating so rapidly. We find this difficult to come to terms with because they assume their culture is inherently superior. I've debated with Muslims about the caliphate. I, in, in, in an almost exclusively Muslim audience with people arguing the caliphate would be a superior form of global organisation to that which we have. Um, but you also get similar absolutist positions, I mean, not offensively put, um, cropping up uh, in every culture. I think only of Max Hastings, um, who used to edit the Evening Standard, where um, he wrote um, that in studying, there's no point in studying anything except European-derived literature or culture. Now, Max is going to get a tremendous shock when confronted by the cultural richness of China or India or um, the Muslim world. And that's not an attitude um, that is only about our literary and cultural legacy of the past. I mean, Asian film today is the most advanced uh, of any in the genre. It powers um, Western products in film. George Lucas himself has said that he could not have made Star Wars without Kurosawa's work preceding him. Not everyone would have seen the similarity between Kurosawa and Star Wars. But it is this interchange now, this movement backwards and forwards of what is best in different cultures that is so important. And if you go on to the streets of a modern world city, whether that's London, <coughs> excuse me, or New York, or Shanghai, or Mumbai, you will see young people on the streets using the same technology and sharing the same concerns. I don't find that particularly new or surprising. As a young man, I crossed the Sahara Desert and spent time with the Tuareg um, communities. I, 20 years ago, after Mrs. Thatcher abolished the GLC and I was unemployed for a year, I took the time um, to go up um, through Nepal to Everest Base Camp and saw there, amongst the Nepalese community, a society very little changed in over 100 years. Wherever you go in the world, broadly people are driven by the same things. They want security for themselves and their family, a better life for their children, 
and a basic degree of tolerance and acceptance of what they believe against other people. They won't always express it that way. But wherever I've been in the world, I don't feel that I'm not at home. If I'm in Madrid or in Moscow, and in later this year when I go to Mumbai, I suspect I will feel that this is somewhere I understand, just as I feel I understand and feel, uh, and feel at home in the cities I've already visited. And in a sense, London's now a microcosm of this. In the struggle for the Olympic Games, New York was able to claim 200 languages were spoken in the city. We were able to demonstrate 300 languages are spoken here. 35 people out of every 100 that work in this city were born in a foreign country. A, something like, um, I think it's now, 62% uh, of people living in this city were born somewhere outside in the rest of the UK or somewhere in the rest of the world. One person in 20 in this city is of mixed race. And consistently since the mayoral system was created and we've been tracking it, Racial and religiously motivated incidents have been declining year by year. They have been cut by 40% over six years. When the chief rabbi says, and I think it's largely true, that there's what he called a tsunami of anti-Semitism across Europe, real increase in anti-Semitism, we are able to demonstrate that in this city, anti-Semitic attacks, like other racial and religiously motivated attacks, and mainly incidents rather than attacks, have been declining. It was that amazing situation where in the aftermath of the July bombings on 7-7, while there were some verbal incidents and some daubing, we are not aware of any instance where one Londoner physically attacked another. another. And therefore, when people talk about clash of civilizations, I say, come and live in London. See that that is not inevitably the human future. So why do we call this conference if it's going so well? I think there's a real danger that we could repeat the tragedy uh, that we saw at the end of the Second World War, when <coughs> the world was being remade and it faced the choice to move towards a system um, where many argued there should be um, a, a competing civilizations and cultures and the best would emerge the strongest and we would look for ways between the extremes posed by America and the Soviet Union. And they lost the debate, they were crushed. In the end, we ended up with a world in two vast armed camps and the diversion of tens of billions of pounds of human wealth into armaments. Two hot wars in Vietnam and Korea and many other cold, slow, dirty wars and coups and upheavals. We think that the Cold War claimed 22 million lives in the military context, <coughs> let alone those that were lost because we couldn't tackle famine and poverty in the way we could have done if so much of the world's resources had not been consumed um, uh, in the arms race. And therefore, you have to ask, was that an accident? If you look at the internal debates taking place around the American administration, the, the body which was the forerunner of the CIA, the OSS, Office of Strategic Services, um, that was operating throughout the Second World War. They were already debating this issue in 1943. An internal document of the Foreign Nationalities Branch in August 1943 said this. Peace, and this is about the war at the world after the end of the Second World War. Peace will not be long enduring until either our way of thought and life or somebody else's becomes general and controlling in the world. We are a nation of nations particularly well equipped for that undertaking. The Cold War wasn't an accident. It wasn't simply because Stalin was a psychopath. It was because a core of people around um, the foreign policy nexus in Washington sought to try and create an American-dominated world. And given that uh, in 1945 America controlled 45% of the productive capacity of the world just in its home nation, it was able to do that. It was able eventually to defeat the Soviet Union. But the world has changed. I mean, no one power will ever have the sort of economic dominance that America had in the 20th century or Britain had in the 19th century. We have to learn to live in a world of equal powers. Sometime, about 20 years from now, 
China will overtake America as the leading economic power. India won't be far behind. 